So typically we use just I was, I was just discussing about uh, where we use uh, different types of norms. So, uh, the reason why the L2 norm is the most popular norm uh, is because it's uh, it can be written like this. The L2 norm squared can be written as X transpose X. So it has lots of good properties. And so it's typical to use the L2 norm in optimization problems. Even if you want to use other norms, it's uh, it's not uncommon to try to reduce it to an L2 norm and then solve a sequence of problems where you're working with the L2 norm and then hope that you will be able to solve the problem involving other norms. L1 norm is typically used when you want to find uh, what are called rob robust estimators. Uh, and it's also used very heavily in compressed sensing, which I teach in the next term, and uh, it's a, it promotes sparse solutions. Sparse solutions are solutions for these vectors where lots of entries of the vector are equal to zero, and the many applications where you want to solve, for example, an equation like AX equals B, but this suppose this has many solutions, you want to find the solution which has the maximum number of zeros in X. And uh, for such things, uh, solving for uh, minimizing L1 such that AX equals B, this optimization problem will lead to sparse solutions for X. Um, L infinity norm, is useful when you want to, you, you care about element by element convergence of properties. However, as I mentioned, um, uh, L, L2 norm is by far the one that is most amenable to optimization. So uh, the norm in which um, uh, the, the norm that is most natural to a given problem may not be the most mathematically convenient or tractable one. And so if you use a different norm to solve the problem, um, we, we want to, uh, ideally we want to know how it is related to the original set out to solve. Um, and uh, so for example, um, if you are considering a sequence of vectors, and uh, you want to look at, this is a sequence of vectors output by a, by a particular algorithm. And if you monitor, say, the L2 norm of these vectors and you find that the L2 norm is converging, or you take the difference between consecutive outcomes of this iterative algorithm, and you find that the L2 norm of that difference is converging, does it mean that the vector itself converges or not? So. To answer these kinds of questions, um, there is a very strong property that norms satisfy, which is that um, um, uh, essentially, um, if a sequence of vectors converges according to a given norm, uh, it in fact converges to the same point with respect to any other norm that you wish to use. And so, uh, so I'll just discuss that aspect a little bit. Uh, sir, what is meant by robust estimation? Is it like I'm like to perform well uh, in the presence of noise or? Um, yeah, certainly you wanted to perform well in the presence of noise, but other norms also uh, will give you um, good properties in uh, recovery in the presence of noise. However, uh, what happens is that um, if you think about it, suppose, um, uh, just go off to the side a bit here. This is a side note. So suppose you have a certain point uh, X naught and you have an algorithm where you hope that the algorithm will return this optimal point x naught, but it returns a different point, call it say x hash. 
and now there is a distance between these two and your algorithm is returning x hash because you've uh, sort of said i want to minimize say something like x uh, some function of x subject to some constraints and effectively if you are looking at uh, say the l2 norm what this is doing is it's it's actually taking the difference between all entries of x hash and the corresponding entries of x not it's squaring them and adding them up and then finally taking a square root so if i consider the square of this uh, euclidean norm uh, you can see that if there are a one particular pair of entries in x hash and x not where this difference is very large because you are squaring it the distance uh, or the euclidean norm will end up becoming a very big number and so this really penalizes the most mismatched entry the most and uh, penalizes the least mismatched entries less but if you take x hash minus x not l1 norm then what this is doing is just looking at the magnitude of the error between x hash and x not and so this essentially penalizes all the errors more or less equally so that is what is called robust estimation so um, you are not giving undue importance to incurring a large error in some components and incurring a small error in other components all errors are equivalent to you and that's what is referred to as robust estimation so if you have yes, if there are many parameters you can estimate yes sir but but i mean how does it translate in ln pt norm uh, there we are only optimizing uh, with respect to only one this maximum element or uh, how many you are looking in in L infinity norm you are looking at the largest entry of x hash minus x not so this is typically used in what are called min max type of problems where what you want to minimize is the maximum deviation uh, across all entries between x hash and x not and when that is important to you then you would use uh, the l infinity norm so yeah okay thank you sir so um, let me define what i mean by convergence of a sequence a uh, sequence of vectors um, so so the main point i'll first write down the punch line here and then i'll discuss further so the punch line is that vector norms can be used to measure convergence of a sequence of vectors so let me define convergence first so let v be a vector space over r or c and let be a vector norm on v so we say the sequence xk so this is a common notation for denoting a sequence you write curly braces xk and sometimes you write k greater than or equal to 1 uh, if you want to say k goes from 1 2 3 up to infinity this uh, of vectors in v converges 
to x, which is also in V, um, with respect to this norm defined like this, if and only if, xk minus x goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. And we will write this as limit k tends to infinity xk is equal to x. Now again I have to write with respect to this norm like this. Okay, so this is the definition and uh, two aspects sort of immediately come out. One is that it seems that in order to define convergence of a sequence of vectors, I need to tell you with respect to which norm I'm asking for this convergence. The second is that if I change the norm, it's possible that this xk will converge to a different point x dash because it's dependent on which norm I'm specifying here. So the two related questions are, one is, is it possible that this given sequence xk converges with respect to one notion of norm, but not in another? And the second question is that, can a sequence converge to two different points with respect to a given norm? Um, uh, so, it turns out that um, the answer to the first question, to both questions is no in finite dimensional space, but it is possible that a sequence converges with respect to one norm, but not in another in infinite dimensional vector space. There is an example in Horn and Johnson, which sh shows that uh, uh, sh shows that uh, a sequence can converge to two different points with respect to two different norms. But we won't discuss that here because the focus of this course is on finite dimensional vector spaces. So the first question is, can a sequence converge in one norm, but not in another? And the answer is, no in finite dimensional vector space. Um, and we'll see why this is true in a minute. But before that, let me write the other question, which is actually easier to, uh, to show. So can a sequence converge to two different points with respect to a given norm? So the answer is no. So that is, is limit k tends to infinity xk equal to x and limit k tends to infinity xk equal to y with respect to the same norm possible and the answer is no and uh, that's uh, that's very easy to see and I, I guess some of you may have already uh, been able to figure out why and the reason follows from triangle inequality so if um, so what we are told is that xk minus x, this goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. And similarly, xk minus y also goes to 0 as k goes to infinity. So what that means is that if I take the norm of x minus y, so that is equal to the norm of x minus xk plus xk minus y. 
which is less than or equal to the norm of this is triangle inequality x k plus x k minus y okay which uh, both of these terms are going to zero as k goes to infinity so this itself goes to zero as k goes to infinity so but the the left hand side is greater than or equal to zero um, and uh, which implies that uh, the norm of x minus y um, uh, and uh, so this is non-negative and but this is a norm so if this becomes equal to zero it implies that x equals y so it has to converge to the same point Sir? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, sir, uh, a particular sequence can converge to different points if we take uh, the norm, uh, different norms. Huh, so that is what I want to show. Now to, to show that a sequence cannot converge to different limits for different norms, there's one other theorem that we'll need. And so this theorem is a, actually a theorem from real analysis. Um, we'll outline the proof, but there is one step that we will need from real analysis, which I won't go into here. Um, so let F1 and F2 be real valued functions. on r to the n for n finite. And suppose three properties hold. First is that fi, so the fi of x is greater than or equal to zero. So these will be, we'll be replacing f1 and f2 with norms later on. So this is true for every x in r to the n and fi of x equals zero if and only if x equals zero. And property B is that fi of alpha x is equal to mod alpha times fi of x for every alpha belonging to r and x belonging to r to the n. And property C is fi of x is continuous on r to the n. Okay, so um, notice that I'm not using, I don't require the triangle inequality, which is part of the definition of a norm. Uh, I just need these three properties, but uh, instead of, uh, or not instead of, but I don't need the triangle inequality, but I do need this continuity property on R to the N. Um, I, I, I will just leave it like this. I think all of you have some idea of what it means for a function to be continuous. Uh, I won't go into the definition of continuity and uh, so on here. Um, in fact, this continuity is really used only in uh, when we use uh, another famous theorem from real analysis called Weierstrass theorem, uh, which is used in the proof. But other than that, um, uh, you know, let's not get into um, the notion of continuity in this uh, uh, right now. Um, so we'll take this on faith that we know what is continuous and what it means for a function to be continuous. So when this is true, then for uh, there exists um, positive constants, which we'll call C small m and C capital M such that C small m times f1 of x 
is less than or equal to F2 of X is less than or equal to C capital M times F1 of X for every X in R to the N. That means now translating this into norms, what this is saying is that um, if you take a different norm, the norm of X uh, with respect to this the second norm of X is sandwiched between some constant uh, times the first norm and some other constant times that same first norm. So that is this result. So the proof goes like this. So let h of x be defined as f2 of x over f1 of x. Therefore, x in some set S, where I'll define this set as S is the set of x in R to the n, such that um, x2, so I'm using the Euclidean norm here, but you can actually use any other norm here, it doesn't matter. So the reason, I mean, the only thing you need is that the set S must be a compact set and it does not uh, include the zero vector. Okay, so um, so that's, again, this is another notion from real analysis that uh, is beyond the scope of this course, but for your reference, you can note that the compact set. Then uh, what we have is that H of X is certainly not zero, um, for any x belonging to S because there is the zero vector is not here and uh, fi of x is uh, positive, strictly positive for any x not equal to zero. And so both these numbers as f1, f2 of x and f1 of x are both strictly positive numbers. And so the ratio is also some strictly positive number. And so h of x is not zero for any x in S. And uh, also H of X is continuous on X belonging to S because of this property C. The ratio of two continuous functions is also con continuous. Okay, uh, so now, what Weierstrass theorem says it says that H, uh, a function H, which has these two properties, it attains a finite positive max maximum C capital M and minimum C small m on the set S. So that implies that we have uh, C small m times F1 of X is less than or equal to f2 of x. So h of x is between is bounded between c small m and c capital M and h of x is just f2 over f1. I'm taking f1 to the other side and then I have c capital M times f1 of x for every x in S. But um, we have that um, If I take um, Z over norm Z, this, it always belongs to S for every non-zero Z in R to the N. So then what I can do is 
in, if I want to show that this holds for every x, I just replace x with uh, x in r to the r. If I want to show that this holds for every z in r to the n, I'll just replace x with z over norm of z uh, for any non-zero z. Then, uh, then by property b, which is the homogeneity property, this norm z can come out of this, and then it will cancel throughout because there will be a one over norm z here, one over norm z here, one over norm z here. It comes out throughout. Uh, so from B, um, the above inequality holds for every non-zero Z belonging to r to the n. But then if z equal to 0, the case is trivial because this is 0 and this is 0, this is also 0. So it's already true. So that concludes this proof. So now the consequence of this is that if um, if you have two different norms, are vector norms on R n. And if xk um, is a given sequence of vectors, then limit k tends to infinity xk is equal to x with respect to alpha if and only if limit k tends to infinity xk is equal to x with respect to beta. So it doesn't matter which norm you consider. If it con converges with respect to a given norm, then it converges to with respect to any other norm. And in fact, it converges to the same point. So the proof is one line. So we have by the previous theorem that Cm times Xk minus X alpha is less than or equal to Xk minus x beta. So there exists exist constant C m and C capital M such that this holds x k minus x alpha. And this is true for every k. Uh, that implies that the x k minus x alpha can only go to zero if and only if. See, this quantity is sandwiched this quantity is sandwiched between these two quantities. So the, if you want this to go to zero, then this side will also go to zero. And that's only possible if this guy is also going to zero. If this is going to some non-zero quantity, then you can't have it being sandwiched between these two if this is going to zero. So this is true if and only if xk minus x beta goes to zero as k goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, basically this implies that um, in the finite dimensional vector space, all norms are equivalent in the sense that whenever xk converges to x with respect to one norm, then it converges to the same x with respect to any other norm. So the, 
I think we're out of time for this class, so we'll stop here and continue the next time.